Are we ready? We're ready. Okay, Go. <laughs> let's rock. <laughs> um, before I started with the MBT, I was very much into creating my reality, like very focused on what I wanted to happen. But nowadays I'm more like relaxed and I'm not so focused on what I want to happen. It's more like, let's see what happens and uh, how can I how can I be in, in service? And I wonder the balance between uh, creating and just be. I, I'm a little bit confused there because I know my intention creates and I would like certain things to happen, but at the same time, I feel like let whatever happen, happen. So. Yeah, could you sure. please sure. talk there about is, that there, a little There bit. is a balance that you need yeah. to strike between those two. And both of those are good things. You can have intentions uh, to have things happen. What's important isn't the... What's important isn't what it is that you want to have happen. It's what's important is why you want to have that happen. And if that why turns out to be something good, it's about growth, it's about caring, it's something valuable, it's something of service, you see, that's what it is that you want to have happen, then that intention is a good thing to do. Uh, if the intention is you want to have happen is, you know, more money in the bank account, you know, a newer car, or, uh, whatever, if it's, if it's all about you, then that intention is just feeding your ego. So as long as your intentions are not primarily feeding your ego, and they're good intentions, and that's a fine thing. On the other hand, just taking what happened, you know, whatever comes, and dealing with it as best you can is also a good thing to do. And there's no reason why you can't do both. It's not an either or. It's a good thing to do. And what happens if you just take what comes and deal with it and move according to your intuition and what you think is good and the right thing for you to be doing? Usually all those things that you intend for kind of fall right into place. The two aren't in competition. They actually both end up in the same place. Because when you're in that mode, of acceptance and giving, those intents you have, even if you don't put a lot of energy into them, they tend to happen a lot more quickly and with less effort. So those two things mostly end up in the same place. The only downside is if, is if you don't do it right on either end. If your intention of what you want to happen is an ego feeder, or if what you do is try to manipulate what happens then the whole thing doesn't, doesn't work. But as long as both of those are done right, there's no reason that you can't do it all. And I think you'll find that they're not incompatible or even different approaches. They all meld into the same, to the same approach. You don't have to avoid one. You don't have to say, oh, having an intent maybe not a good thing. Well, it's only not a good thing if it's intent for not a good reason. Tom, I want to circle back to meditation. <clears throat> um, uh, recently, I, I feel uh, I have been focusing more and more on um, some pretty deep meditation. I had some uh, pretty deep experiences uh, of late, and uh, uh, perhaps it's what you would refer to as point consciousness. I, for me, it was almost uh, as though in the end, um, when I opened my eyes, I was seeing my room and my house and my, my life in a new way. For It lasted for quite a long time. Um, and so uh, I have had some past experience with some Buddhist meditation. And, and so the Buddhists speak about awareness of being. And there's a statement, beyond ego is universal being. Beyond being is the infinite. So what is point consciousness or the experience of point consciousness in the context of MBT? Um, when one is in that state, uh, are, you experiencing, are, are you experiencing being from an I IOUC level or something deeper? Um, so I'm just trying okay. to put it in the context. Point consciousness, I describe as what it feels like is that you exist 
as a point of consciousness floating in an infinite void. Okay? That's not what it is. That's what it feels like. Okay? This is what it feels like. So you're aware that you exist. You're kind of at the, at the Descartes thing of, you know, I think, therefore I am. So you're aware. I'm aware, and I am. And that's about all there is. It's just that awareness of being and nothing else is there. So you've let go of all of your sense data, which means you're not hearing, seeing, feeling, any of that stuff. That's all gone. And you haven't actually grabbed onto anything else. You're just there. And many uh, Eastern disciplines, I think, call that nirvana. It's a very peaceful place. It's a place of supreme rest. and You can get energized there. It's very quiet because there's nothing, no sound. So that's probably the infinite they were talking about, and it's probably the being they were talking about because you, you are, and you also feel connected. You don't feel lost. It's not like you're, you know, like, like you're lost in this thing at all. It's a belonging. You're being there. You're, you're at one with it. You and this void seem to all be part of the same thing. It's a connectedness that you feel in that state, not a... Oh, I'm a tiny, it's not like being in an inner tube in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you know, where you're all alone and looking for some company. It's a, it's a sense of calm and peace, belongingness, connectedness, but it's empty. Okay. Now, that's MBT's, my viewpoint of the void. But though many disciplines, that's the end point. That's where you're trying to get to. And for some disciplines, going any further than that is a mistake. More ego lies on the other side, you see. So that's sort of like a top of a globe. And if you move beyond that, you go back into the ego. You know, you've reached the top. And no matter what direction you go, you end up going back, backwards into ego. For me, that's a doorway. This point consciousness is a place from which you can start. It's not an end point. It's a lovely place. And the first few times you get there, you have a tendency to just want to hang out there, just be there, just float in, just experience that peace because it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a relaxation and a being and a connectedness that you don't experience anyplace else. It's very profound. So that's point consciousness. But once you're at point consciousness, and once you can not just kind of drift through it for a few seconds, but you can hang out there for kind of as long as you want, then you can use that as a doorway to anything else. While you're in point consciousness, it's a good time to ask those questions. It's a good time to access those databases because you're perfectly clear in your mind there. All the noise is gone. So your intent now becomes powerful and focused. That's a good place from which to heal. That's a good place from which to remote view. That's a good place to do most anything. It's a good place to experience other things. So for me, that's the, that's the doorway to everything else. And in that way, I differ a lot from the Buddhists because they would think that you go through that doorway and the other thing else, like into remote viewing or into healing or things, now you're back into the world of ego. It doesn't have to be that way. You're only back into the world of ego if when you approach those other things, you approach them with ego. You see, but if you've left your ego behind, it's behind. It's not that you have ego except when you're in this place and you're in the, in the void and now your ego's gone. Well, that's true. That's an easy place that you're not full of yourself because really there's no choices. Well, it's kind of thought, oh, I don't have any ego. Well, you don't have any choices either. It's easy to not have any ego. You see? So that's one of the reasons that I think the Buddhists found that a very useful state to hang out in, because it was a state of no ego, because it was a state of no choice. It was just being. That's all there was to it. All right? And then if you had ego and you got in that state, well, you kind of got rid of your ego while you were there, and then when you came back, the ego's here again. So the concept was that once you leave there, the ego comes back. Well, if you didn't have the ego in the first place, it doesn't come back. In that case, it's a door. And you can get to that doorway, and that's the launch pad. What else would you like to experience? Would you like to experience 
other reality systems other than this one. Would you like to do this? You can have conversation with the larger conscious system. You can have conversation with others. It's just a real productive place because you finally got to the low noise, kind of the, the minimum noise state for your, for your consciousness. You're not thinking anything. You're just floating in that void. And you're just there. Nothing happening. See, that's the, if you look at the noise level in your consciousness, that's the big dip in the curve is when you get to that void. That's why it's a good space to do anything else in. So that's my view of it. That uh, It's a good launch point. Now, if you do have lots of ego and you get there, then I suspect when you, wherever you go, that ego goes with you. You know, once you get into another virtual reality where you're making choices, you got ego, you got ego, whether it's back here or someplace else. So that doesn't change. And being in that void doesn't really help you get rid of ego. It just helps you experience not having ego because it's, you know, it's that kind of a place. But again, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a fake way of experiencing not having any ego because the reason you don't have any is you don't have any choices because there's nothing to choose. You're just in the void. There's no actions to take. There's no relationship. There's no, you know, you're just connected to the whole in one big thing, but there's no actions. There's nothing you have to do. You just be there. It's a place of being, not a place of doing. So then if you change from there to some place of doing, you stay in the same low noise level consciousness, you don't let that go. So this then becomes your, you, know, you kind of go there, now you know you're at your low level of you know, noise and your consciousness, you're kind of at your peak in your abilities and understanding and a clarity with your mind and keep all that, but now come up with an intention. What would, questions, what data do you need? What information is gonna help you? What do you, you know, what is it about this reality that puzzles you that you'd like to understand more? What is it about yourself that puzzles you that you'd like to understand more? And then you can go for that information. And uh, great launch pad, great doorway. So that's why I tell people, learn to go there first. When you hang out in that point consciousness, that's a good place to hang out. Now, it takes most people a little while before they get there and hang out, but it's not as hard as it sounds. Mostly the difficulty in meditation is the difficulty you bring to it. It's not that meditation is so hard, it's that you bring a lot of junk with you that makes it hard for you to meditate. It's the offloading of junk, not a better technique that you need. It's not that your technique is faulty. It doesn't really need a technique. You can slip into point consciousness in tenth of a second. It's not technique that's, that's the problem. It's, it's the trash you bring along with you that's the problem. Expectations are the problem. Uh, beliefs, fears, all that stuff gets in the way. But yeah, it's a wonderful state. Yeah, if you've been there, you know. And you, and you can see things. Because if your mind, you know, when you're there, if you're not really thinking thoughts. You're just existing. But if your mind does drift to something, you'll notice that those thoughts manifest very quickly. So if your mind just happened to drift to, you know, what are my issues? You know, what's, what's my, you know, this life I'm living, you know, what can I do better about it? There it is, instantly, right in front of you. You see the problems, you see the issues, what you're doing, what you're doing wrong. I mean, it's a very powerful place to be in because it, it uh, is where you're clear. So that's probably, uh, that's probably what happened. You probably were in there kind of just hanging out, and a thought drifted into your mind, and that's all it takes. A thought drifts into your mind, a little question, well, what about this or something, and then suddenly, boom, there it all is. You get the answer, right? Technicolor, <laughs> right? Dolby, Dolby uh, surround sound, you know, you get the whole, you get the whole thing happens all at once, and it's, it's pretty uh, profound when it does, but you can do that same thing about anything. That's the place to... That's the place to start. Hi, Tom. Hey. So my question is, as we start off as an IOUC, are we starting off as like a bumblebee 
and then growing from there into a human carnation? And if so, once we get to a human carnation, as we grow our quality of consciousness, are we getting bigger challenges to work on things? And is there a threshold to where we've worked on enough to where now we're not working on big challenges anymore, but we're actually coming back to help? Yeah, the, there's kind of a yes to all of those, but the first one is a very conditional yes. And uh, it's possible for the bumblebee to work its way up to well, what comes next, who knows? You know, a pigeon or, you know, a bird brain, right, from a bee brain. It's, it's possible that that can come up and go up and up and up. If it keeps doing well, making good decisions, it can go up the chain and eventually it could end up being human or whatever. That's not impossible. It happens. And there is this trickle up through various levels. But that's not the main place. That's not the main way that we get to be an individual unit of consciousness. The main way we get to be an individual unit of consciousness is that they need more individual unit of consciousness because there's more avatars. You've got more avatars and they need players. Okay, well, you know, that's been, that's been going up over the last three million years. It keeps constantly uh, increasing, going up faster now. And the best way to get one of those new IUOCs in a digital system is copy and paste. Take a good example, you know, a good kind of average example. Copy, 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 copy. How many do you need? Okay, but you start with something generic. The reason you start with something generic is because it's the growing process that's important. It's not the end process. So if you say, well, okay, if we're going to do that, why start with something generic? Why not go to the top? Just create, you know, enlightened, love, all the way entities. And send them in. Well, there's no entropy reduction in that, you see. So you can have something that reduces entropy. Let's say you have a, a book. An amazing book that tells a lot of great things. Just the ink on the page is an entry production for the ink in the bottle. You've arranged the ink in, in structure, right? And the knowledge in the book, that's a, that's a much lower entropy. Okay? Now you can take that book and duplicate it a hundred times. The duplication of the book doesn't lower entropy any. You see? All you've done is just take something that's the same, it's the same, it's the same. So just duplicating an entity that has a higher, a lower entropy, isn't the point. The point is the effort. The point is the change. The point is the growing up. That's what, that's what makes the difference. You start with something that's a good starting model, right? And then you, you uh, let those go. And very quickly, they differentiate themselves because they have different experiences. All the different experiences they have with different avatars make them different, and they get, to, they get to grow up. So that's sort of what I mean when I say new IUOCs are coming in at the bottom all the time. It just means they don't have experience here. And some of them may have been around a long time. They may be holdouts that just never got into the virtual reality. Maybe the word got around it can be kind of tough here. And that it's a, it's a, it's a big uh, comeuppance when you think you're really, you're really grown up and you've you know, got it all on the ball and you get in a virtual reality and find out you, you don't have any idea, you know, what was inside of you and what could come out of you until you get in a thing, in a situation where you're challenged, like we're challenged here. Consequences that we get here. So, now all of those would be new, new entities here. Some could be pretty old, but just starting in this game. So that's pretty much the other two. So, yeah, you can go up through the ranks, but that's not the main way. That bubbles very slowly. I can never keep up with the need for IUOCs. So it's just copy and paste when you need one. And do the, uh, as we grow, do the challenges that we come across yeah, get right. bigger and bigger? And 
is there a point to where we've worked on enough? Because I know you say right. we yes. come back and help, but even when we come back and help, maybe the, even the challenge to our side may look big, but do you still deal with these big challenges yourself? Yes. Challenges keep growing. As you, it's just like going up through the grades. You know, between third grade and sixth grade, the work's harder. You know, between sixth grade and you know, high school, the work's harder. You get into graduate school, the work's harder. So it doesn't matter. Every time you go up a step, the work gets harder. But you get more capable of doing it. So the challenges are always there, yes. As you grow up, the, the challenges are still challenging. It's not like there's nothing but third grade, you know, and now, you know, you're a sixth grader, so you know more than everybody, and it just stays that way. There's always challenges. And dealing with people, when you get to the, to your last question, yes, you get to a point where it's not so much about you and your, your personal growth as it is about other people, and you hear more, not just, oh, this is a good opportunity for me to learn how to manage my anger, but it's a good opportunity to learn how to be useful, and how to help, and how to give, how to care. So it changes a little bit. It's not so much working on yourself as you're working on yourself in your relationship to others. And that always has challenges. Whenever you have a relationship with other people, there is no way to take the challenge out of that. Because it's all kinds of other people at all sorts of levels. And you have to deal with those. You have to be helpful to them. And you know that it's not helpful to somebody just to explain to them what the right answer is. That's not helpful. So it's not that you come back and you just teach. You have to be. You have to connect. You have to be a part of their life. And you have to be helpful. And that's always a challenge. So I don't think that will ever not be challenging. Relationship is the most challenging thing that we do. It's more challenging than graduate school. <laughs> you know, it's the most challenging thing we do is have good relationships. Because we have a good relationship when we can give. When we know how to love, that's what makes good relationships. When it's not about what we get, but rather about what we give. So you are learning still, and you are challenged, and you're still growing, but you're just doing it at a different, different level, and your challenges are harder, and what's expected of you is more, just like any other progression of growing up. You know, when you're five years old, people cut you a lot of slack. When you're 50 years old, not so much. They expect you to know better by then. So it's kind of the, it's kind of the same way. But we know 50-year-olds that act more like five-year-olds. We probably work for some of them, right? OK. Yes. Can we help people who have moved on to the other side? We have what? Who have died without going out of body. So the Monroe Institute has this lifeline experience, yeah. for instance, where they go out of body and they help people who are stuck. Mm -hmm. Do you really need to go out of body for that? No. Well, you've asked a, a question that I hesitate to answer, but I'll answer it anyway because we'll just let the chips fall where they may. A lot of, a lot of that sort of thing is like the dreams I was discussing earlier, where you're put in a situation, and what are you going to do? How are you going to act? So it's not that that situation doesn't come up, that there's never a case to help somebody. That does come up occasionally, because people sometimes are so obsessed with something often because of the conditions of the death. They're so obsessed with something that it's hard for them just to let go and go on. They're so locked into it. And those cases sometimes need some help to help them break out of it. Because you no longer have the physical to break you out. You know, if you're obsessed here, well, you gotta take a break to get something to drink. You know, you gotta go get something to eat. You gotta go, you know, you gotta call your wife and tell her where you are. You know, you got things you have to do which kind of breaks you out of that obsession. It's not like that in the non-physical. You get really obsessed with your mind, you're just kind of stuck in that hole until uh, somebody can help you get out of it. 
or until it just wears off. You've just worn yourself out uh, with it. So there are some cases where that's the case, but they're few and far between. They're, the, they're in the margins. They're long into the margins. Most of the rescue missions of helping people who need to go from death to, to uh, a new incarnation, most of those are situations created by the larger consciousness system so that people can help them and learn and make good choices. So it's part of a learn, it's, it's another lesson plan. It's another uh, game to play, if you will. Okay, here we play, you know, be a, be a human and, and uh, you know, deal with people and have relationships, raise children. You know, that's what we're doing here. There the game is, you know, save, you know, Save the people, you know, who are stuck between this life and the next. Help them out. It's a different game, but it's got all the same attributes to it. The idea is to, here's a situation. What are you going to do? How are you going to deal with it? It helps you with relationship because you have to deal with somebody who's having issues and having problems and difficult. You have to deal with uh, um, giving. It has to be a very giving thing, a very caring thing. It can't be about you. You're not going to go help somebody and then get an argument with them, right? Because tell them they're wrong and you know you get in a fight. You see, you have to. It's a it's an exercise. It's a lesson. And the reason I hesitated to say that is because that may ruin the experience for a whole lot of people who feel like indeed they are performing this very necessary function. Of helping these people cross over and if they don't have their ego invested in it then they will find that it's just as useful and just as meaningful and just as significant to be doing this in another virtual reality such that they're learning all the same things see what's really significant about that process is not who you help but it's what you learn in the helping process it's what you give to it. That's really what the lesson is. The larger conscious system can help itself with the transition. It doesn't really need us to help it out to do that. It can take any form, any shape. It can use anybody's data that it wants for a persona. I mean, it's got all the tools that it can do what it needs to do when it needs to do it. It's not like, well, it just can't figure it out, but we can. We can help. You know, we can make that process work, whereas the system somehow was at a loss and didn't know how to do it. Nobody was there to help. So that isn't really the case most of the time. Occasionally it is the case. But most of the time it's just another virtual reality lesson plan, sort of like a dream that you could put into. But don't discount that. That doesn't make it less important. And for all the people that will hear this and the 50,000 people will see it later, you know, if you're one of those people doing that and this just takes the wind out of your sails, don't let that happen. That's ego. That's the wrong way to look at it. It should put wind in your sails. This is an opportunity given to you to do some very special things to learn from that process. Okay. And you should be glad that you had the opportunity and you should do it and you should do it very seriously. Take it very seriously. You know, a virtual reality game is only really good when you take it seriously. I mean, here we are. We take it seriously because when we don't, it hurts. Right? So we take this thing really seriously. We're like, oh, it's just a virtual reality. You know, I can step off this cliff and it's, it's all virtual reality. You know, some, my words you get paid if it's meant to be. You know, well, we can't do that. We have to take it seriously. Otherwise, it doesn't work. The feedback goes away as soon as you don't take it seriously. You see, so it loses its effect. And that's the same with the dream reality. It's the same with, with this thing that you're talking about. So it is a serious thing. It's a good exercise to do. The people who do it learn valuable things from it. And there isn't anything at all not quite real or whatever, except if you got your ego in it, then it was going to be like a smack to think that it's an exercise rather than the real thing. Now let's take a look at that though. What's the difference between an exercise in a virtual reality and the real thing? 
what is the real thing? An exercise in virtual reality, right? Consciousness is the only thing that's fundamental. Everything else is a virtual reality. Whatever you do anywhere, under any circumstances, for any reason, is exercise in a virtual reality. And it's all meant for you to make choices and grow up from the choices. So when you say, well, that's not really real. That's just an exercise in a virtual reality. That's a silly thing to say because what's real? What's really real is an exercise in a virtual reality. There isn't anything more real than that to our awareness. So yes, it's real. It's as real as real gets. But it's part of a lesson plan. It's not necessarily what you think it is. And this reality is like that too. It's not necessarily what you think it is. It's part of a lesson plan. We're here in school learning. And things happen to us to nudge us to learn. Things happen to us to wake us up. We get experiences that say, hey, you know, reality's bigger, more complex than you thought, right? These things just happen to us to wake us up. And is that fake? Oh, that's not real. No, that's the way the real reality works. So all realities are making choices in virtual realities. If you're not making choices in virtual reality, you're not, you're not functioning. So to call one of them more real than the other is false. They're not. That dream reality is just as real as this reality. It's just different. And that rescue mission of saving the people or helping the people cross over is just as real as this reality. It's just different. So I'm trying to make the people feel better who are going to be <laughs> upset because you asked the question. But they shouldn't be upset because if they are, that's the ego and they need to get over that, basically. But all reality is making choices in a virtual reality. That doesn't make it a lesser reality. It's only a different set of choices. And in that rescue program, that's a different set of choices. There's nothing you can do here. Dream reality works the same. Out of body works the same. All virtual realities in which you get to make choices all have the same point. Choices either help you grow up or they don't. So, does that uh, put that in perspective? It seems to me reasonable that the Earth may be a living entity and that the Internet is analogous to a nervous system which connects us for whatever purpose there is. Okay. First part of the question is, if, there's any, if that seems reasonable, is it possible that, that the Earth is an individual unit of consciousness? And if so, what might it do to decrease entropy? The second part is, if, you, if I go into a restaurant many days now and see four people seated around a table, everybody has a phone in hand, and eight thumbs flying, okay? They're spending more time connected to that, to the nervous system, than they are with interaction between one another. In addition, with the accelerating pace of life, we have less human contact. And so I wonder what, where that trend might take us. Okay. Uh, first of all, the Earth, I would not think of the Earth as a IUOC. I would think of the Earth, though, as kind of part of the media in which we exist. Remember, this is a virtual Earth. Okay? And we only have consciousness by virtue of a consciousness playing our avatar. So this virtual Earth is ones and zeros as well, just like our bodies are. So it would have to be a consciousness playing the avatar Earth. Avatar Earth. I don't think makes a lot of free will choices. It kind of does what it has to do. It's more uh, um, not a choice maker. So I don't really see that. But I see it in a metaphorical sense. I do see it. Because as we grow up, as we become more caring, it's not just caring for other humans. It's caring for everything. It's caring for all the critters. It's caring for the earth. It's caring for the trees. It's caring for everything will become a part of us. And we're not going to see ourselves as we're separate. We humans, and then there's the earth, and then there's these critters and something that's all going to be one thing. And when we do that, we're going to encompass all of it within our own caring, within our own love. And it'll all seem like it's all part of one big thing. So in that way, metaphorically, yes, I see that happening. We will be custodians of this place, and we'll take that seriously. And 
we will be custodians of other critters who could use our help. We'll take that seriously. And we will butt out of their life when we're not much help. We'll take that seriously. We will recognize all the other critters as conscious beings just like we are, evolving just like we are, not something that's tasty to eat. See, we'll have a whole different attitude toward conscious entities. And we'll have a whole different attitude toward the planet, the atmosphere, even the universe. We'll have this different attitude. And yes, we'll feel like we are all connected to it. And everything's connected together and we have responsibility. And in that responsibility, we'll see ourselves as part of a whole, not as separate things, off doing our own thing, using the stuff that isn't us. You know, right now we see the use of the earth as a resource. We use it. We don't see it as a responsibility you know, to take care of and that we're sharing this with all the other critters on it, conscious or not. So we'll just have a whole different perspective. And yes, in a metaphorical way, we'll all kind of become one with each other, with the critters, with the, with the earth, with the whole thing, because we're all in it together. We'll see ourselves as just another animal that crawls around on the surface of the earth, except we have more decision space. And with that extra decision space, we can take care of those that have less decision space. And that'll be part of our responsibility. So metaphorically, yes. Actually, I wouldn't say that it's a, an objective thing because it's a ones and zero earth and unless some conscious player wants to play that, which I don't see that because there's no choices in there that are really going to be the kind of choices that helps an IUC evolve. And what was the second part of your question? That we spent so much time connecting to the internet, uh, oh. we're not spending Right, how do, how, do we, how do we see the evolution of uh, our interactions when so much of it now is automated? Yeah, we, we spend less and less time in face-to-face -face right. interaction. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was brought up in the film. If any of you watched the film. Um, I think that the Internet is a wonderful thing. I think the Internet is terrific. And I think it's because of the internet that we now have the opportunity to bond together in cooperation. Because as long as we were fragmented, as long as, as the, I mean, there've been little, I call them like little pools or puddles or little bubbles of, I hate to use the word, but little bubbles of enlightenment, little bunches of people who really saw big pictures. We've had those for thousands and thousands of years, but they've never been able to get together. They've always just been isolated in various cultures around a planet. They don't last real long because the rest of the culture eventually runs over them or just as deadly accepts them, becomes part of them and dilutes them and adds dogma and all kinds of other junk to it and rituals and stuff. So it's really difficult to come together when everything's always split up like that. The ideas don't feed, they're all local. And it comes and it goes, and it gets diluted. And that's the way it's been. So it's not like nobody's thought of these ideas before. Yeah, well, maybe double slit experiments is a little new, but you know, the big ideas here have been around a long, long, long time. The internet is the first, gives us the first opportunity for all these little bubbles of enlightenment to connect, to see each other as part of the solution. And if they really are bubbles of enlightenment, they will see each other as part of the solution, not as competition, you see. So if we begin to see each other as part of the solution, we begin to help each other. We begin to you know, get reinforced by each other. You know, these things kind of help, help uh, spread. We, we talk to each other, that's good. And if we're gonna really care about the people who live, you know what, 8,000 miles away from us? Well, if it's just because we heard once that there were people 8,000 miles away from us that live somewhere, it's really hard to care much about them. But we see their pain up close and personal in their eyes and in their faces because of the internet, it's a lot harder not to care. So, the internet's bringing us together in a way that we never could be brought together before. 
I think that gives humanity its first opportunity ever since it started in the simulation, the first opportunity ever to actually cooperate and evolve in a giant step. Oh, it's been evolving, percolating a little bit, little bit. And little bits get really evolved over here for a while, and then they kind of disappear or get absorbed or something, and then another one will pop up someplace else. And they're all over the planet. You can find little groups of people who have very big pictures and are very knowledgeable and very grown and, and very highly evolved. There's just not a whole lot of them. And eventually, they get old and they go away and you know, it disappears. But now, I think it can grow and expand because we have the technology and communications to join it together. Because you join all those groups together and now you're talking about a lot of people. That gives those people more confidence to go out and tell their stories. Their stories get more, get spread around more quickly. What, I, what we do here in a, in a month or two, when we get it out on YouTube, will be seen by thousands and thousands of people all over the planet. See, and it used to be, it would be seen by us, you know, 47 people or something, and that was it. That'd be the end of it. It's gone. That spreads real slowly. But now it's going to be 47,000 people, and they're not going to all be here. They're going to be all over the place. Different countries, different languages. Fortunately, English has become kind of a common language all over. Everybody in foreign countries tends to learn English as a second language because it's useful. So it's going to spread around. See, that's different. Didn't have that before. Before, I could have had these ideas, and after you know, 50 years, there'd still only be you know, 100 people that had ever heard about it. Well, it's not like that anymore. Before, you know, I would have had to jump through all sorts of hoops in order to get my books published. Well, when I tried to publish my books, I had lots of people interested, but what they were interested in was changing what I had into something that was more profitable for them. I said, what do you want these books to be? They're so, you know, it's so confusing. Is it touchy-feely self-help or is it science? <laughs> Those are two different genera. They, they don't talk to each other. They're not the same buyers. Pick one or pick the other. Mix into both is deadly. Nobody will buy it. Science guys won't buy it because it has touchy-feely in it. Touchy-feely guys won't buy it because it has science in it. It's a dead end. Change the book. Oh, your book's got what? 900 pages? That won't work. Come back with 300 and we'll talk. You see? So that's what you get when you have to go through a publisher 20 years ago or 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Not anymore. We got the internet. I make a website and put it out. And I'm patient. I just wait. Here I am. You know, that was 2003. Had a website. Now all of my videos together have millions of views. I get 4 million people you know, on my website. I get, I don't know, 25, 27,000 subscribers. And I didn't need a publisher. All I needed was the Internet. So the Internet's really a wonderful thing. You see, it's going to help us grow up. All right, it's got some drawbacks. There's a lot of con artists working the Internet. There's a lot of real low-quality people working the Internet. There's a lot of really low-quality people, you know, that uh, are feeding the Internet. True. And there's a lot of people sitting around doing this instead of talking to each other. But in the long run, I think that's going to be better. It's better to have a significant relationship like this than to have a trivial relationship with the people around you. Because if that person far away from you, you're really connecting with something because you have similar ideas or similar whatever. You know? So it's somebody that you can connect with, that group, that forum, whatever. That's information. You couldn't have done that before. You're kind of isolated. Well, the people around you may not want to talk about the nature of reality. Hey, would you like to talk with me about the nature of reality? You know, that doesn't work, does it? No, no, that doesn't, that doesn't work at all, you see? So if you want to talk to people about the nature of reality, you need an Internet, or you can't do it. 
you see? That's how you found out about this talk. If it wasn't for an internet, you wouldn't be here. You see how it, how it helps? Well, okay, we have people that are locally not talking to each other, but they're talking to somebody. And they're not losing all their skills entirely. And if they grow up and become less self-centered, they'll start talking to people around them. If they understand what they're here for and what their mission is, they'll realize that relationship is key. And there isn't any kind of challenge than a face-to-face -face relationship with another human being. And that that's important. And they'll, they'll understand that. So eventually as we grow up, I think the, the uh, you know, you see a bunch of, you see a picture of, you know, seven kids sitting around a table. And all of them are doing this, you know, nobody, none of them are talking to each other. All right, that's a, that's a phase we're going through and, and that will be there. And that may always be there to some extent. But as people grow up, they'll realize the value of person-to-person -person connections. That's where the traction is. That's where the rubber meets the road in growing up. That's where you really have to give when you're dealing with some other personality that sees the world very differently than you do. That's where you have to grow, you see. So I think that'll take care of itself in time. I'm not too worried about that. The positives that the internet brings to us are much, much greater than the negatives that it brings. We can deal with the, you know, with the low lifes and, the, and the, the hustlers and all the rest of that. We'll eventually deal with all of those. You know, as time goes on, we've been dealing with them. You know, security gets better. You know, hacking into your bank account gets harder and harder. But we had to learn. Bank accounts had to be hacked. Otherwise, the security people wouldn't have written the code. So, you know, it's all a learning process. This internet's a very new thing. And uh, the Industrial Revolution was kind of wild and woolly there for a while, too, in the early days. It tends to settle down in time. And as people grow up, there'll be maybe fewer hustlers fewer people trying to use other people, but there'll always be some. That's just the nature of it. So that's my thought, is that it's a, it's a real positive thing in a, in a bigger picture. Matter of fact, it's the one thing, I think more than anything else, that will allow us to get traction now and grow up as a species, humans, rather than this, these 20 or 30 or 100 or 1,000 humans over here are growing up nicely, but that doesn't help the other 7.5 million. This might help the other seven and a half million because it goes out on the internet and now there's millions that will be exposed to it. So that's powerful. That's really, really powerful. So the internet and I are best friends. We, you know, I, I watch out for the hustlers, but uh, it's, a, it's really a, the, a thing that we've waited for. Until this point, humanity had no chance of taking these kind of ideas and moving them into the mainstream. Just impossible. Would never happen. That's why it's been, what, when did Buddha say this, that, the, that our reality was an illusion? Well, what's different than that and saying it's a virtual reality, right? That idea was around 2,500 years ago. Well, what's different then and now? What's different now is projectors, internets, you know, spreading the information electronically. That's really what's different now. So we got a shot now that we've never had before. This is like a first in humanity. We finally got to the point that we have the technology to actually make this work. And we need technology because our family's so big. You see, you can get that kind of closeness and love and caring in a family. Some families. <laughs> Even there, sometimes it's hard to get. But in families, you can get that, right? With 10 people or 20 people, that's achievable. Okay, once it's hundreds of people and thousands of people and millions of people spread out over, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles, that gets to be really problematical. Family? I don't even, I've never met those people. They're not my family. I don't even like them because they're not like me, you know. That kind of thing is what you get because they're removed. So this internet is going to make that not like me kind of disappear because we'll know those people. We'll feel their pain to some extent as we grow up. So I think we've got an opportunity we've never had before, and the internet is the, is the key to that opportunity. So that's, uh, so I'm very happy that uh, we're in the, we finally made it to the information revolution, when what we are is an information system. Now we can begin to communicate and get something done.
this is, in a way, that's very exciting. You know, we've been evolving here for a couple of million years, and this is really the first time we've ever had a shot at actually taking a big step forward in our evolution. Now, I don't know that we're going to do that in the next 100 years or so. You know, it's hard to say. But at least we have a shot at it. It's possible where it wasn't before as a species making a, making a change, huh? Good time to be here. Good time to be here. Yeah, this is, these are exciting times. We really can do it now. Okay, Tom. Uh, based on your experience, and I know you, well, you have more experience than most of us, how should we deal with information that's not, that we haven't experienced ourselves? Because, I mean, I have my own experiences, and then there's all this information, this, like, worlds of information. In many cases, it's negative information about wars, about tragedies, mm -hmm. about, but it, it isn't my experience. So um, why should I get down, why should I be upset, sad, depressed from something that I didn't experience directly? And how should I process that information compared to the information that I have taken myself? Mm -hmm. Okay? So. Yeah. If it's not your experience, it's not your truth. Right? So if you see things and it's outside of your experience, then you have no way to process them. You only have a choice whether to believe them or not believe them. Okay? So here's, the, and, and that has a lot to do with the things that I tell people. I tell you things, and oh, here's what it is when, you know, when you die, this happens and that happens, you come back. If it's not your experience, it can't be your truth. And you should not believe me. You should just want to find out for yourself. Or if that's not in your future, you should just decide to take that as a possibility. All right, this is a possibility. I heard that. And maybe that's true. Maybe that's not. I'll keep it in mind. But don't believe it. Believing it isn't helpful. So you see tragedy someplace. Why should you shouldn't get upset? You shouldn't. You can get sad. Sad's fine. But upset's an ego thing. So it just happens. You know that. You know that this world's full of greed and, and nastiness, and you see greed and nastiness someplace. You accept it that that's the way it is. You're sad that it is that way, but that's the way it is. You do what you can do to help. Maybe you send the people that have the, the earthquake or the whatever, you know, maybe you send them some charity or something else. But you shouldn't get upset about it. You should just accept that that's the way the world is now. And that if you haven't experienced it directly, now you don't have to experience everything directly. If you've ever experienced hardship directly, if you've ever wondered how you were going to pay those bills that you had, and, you know, where was the food coming from, where was the mortgage going to come from, you've really, really been tight to where you had to put off your creditors for another month because you really couldn't afford to pay them. You had to pay these other creditors first. And most of us have been through times like that. You know, that's the way it is for most students, you know, when you're a student in college and graduate school. You kind of live in that uh, you know, poverty level and, and uh, you wonder how you're going to you know, pay your bills and that sort of thing. Well, you don't have to experience the hardship that's going on some other place in the world, but you can empathize with it because you do have experience. No, you didn't have that experience. You know, you've never been a refugee you know, sleeping in the dirt because your house got blown up and you're with a bunch of people. You've never experienced that but you've experienced hardship. You've experienced being helpless. You've experienced things that give you pain. So you can have empathy for people, even though you've never been dislocated, had your house blown up, you know, and had to sleep in the dirt. You still can connect to that. But there's some things you can't connect to because they're just outside of your experience. Like when I tell you what it is like when you die and or, you know, do that. If that's not your experience, if you've never watched that happen or been aware of those cycles, then you can't believe it. Don't believe it. Keep it as a possibility that makes sense and then test it against your own data. See, one day you may be able to do that, follow somebody. You know somebody who's dying and you may go just, you don't have to be with them physically, but you may just connect with them and follow them in the path, follow them on their journey, see what happens to them. Or you may go uh, into that point consciousness state and say, I'd like to witness, I'd like to see this process. 
And you can see the whole process. You can be there when they come out of that tunnel of light, right? And you can be there and watch it. You can watch the whole process take place. You can even be a part of it. You can even say, I'd like to do, I'd like to help here. You can get a job there working in that process. Okay? And you'll be doing that probably while you're sleeping. It probably, it could be a dream, but it could just be like out of body or it could, you know, it could be any number of different ways. But you may work in that process and learn about it. So then it will be your experience. So these are the things. And sometimes you don't even believe your own experience, right? You have an experience and you say, did I just make that up? Is that my imagination or is that really an experience? Well, the point there is, is it useful? Did you learn something? Was it valuable? If it is, then don't worry about really where it came from. Data is data. It doesn't have any markers on it where it comes from. You're always skeptical of it anyway, but eventually you learn really, really doesn't matter. This idea of vetting, where does it come from? Should I believe it or not? One, you shouldn't believe anything. And two, doesn't matter where it came from. That's not how we judge it. We judge it on, is it useful? Not on who said it. So even if I'm the one that's saying it to myself, it doesn't matter. If it's useful, it's useful. If I learn from it, I learn from it. If it makes my life better and I can lower entropy because of it, that's grand. I don't really care where it comes from. That's vetting the, the source is something we do here, but not there. It's not, it doesn't help us there. So that's the thing. So you'd be skeptical of everything. You never know where it comes from. We never get to see the source. All we get is the information, the data. We see the data, never the source. That's why you always have to make your own free will choices. You can't consult a psychic to tell you what to do next. It's giving up your free will. You can't, you know, you can't live like that. Or you can't go to, you know, Big Brother or your parents or somebody else and say, what should I do? That's your choice. You can go ask for, what am I missing here? <laughs> how, how else can I look at this problem? Do you see any other alternatives? You know, it's guidance. But you have to make the choice. You always have to make the choice. So you get information, you get data, you get a job at the in-processing part of the, of the people who have died, and, so again, and you work at it for a while, you learn something, you get a sense of it, eventually you'll know whether this new information is totally new or something you could have made up. You'll know because the real data that's outside of you will become obviously it's outside of you. That just wasn't in there. You say, oh, I never would have thought of that. They do that? You know, that's just not in you to have done that, but yet you see that. And if it makes sense and it helps you, then you do it. So the way you, you deal with things like that is, one, have empathy for the things where you do have at least some experience. Just accept that that's the way things are for the things where you have no experience. Believe nothing and only make your choices based on your own, you know, your own free will. And then when you do that, of course, you own it. If it doesn't turn out well, well, you'll do better next time. Let that be. Let that uncertainty be. Let it be okay that you don't do well. Just do the best you can. Make that choice. And if it doesn't work out, if it was a bad choice, you'll learn something. If it does work out, good for you. See, that's the thing. We get tied up sometimes in needing to know what is the best choice here. I don't know how to approach it. Tell me what the best choice is. Just do it. Make the choice that seems right to you at the time. Do it and then be aware of what the consequences are. How did that work and why did it work that way? That's how you grow up, not by stewing over getting the optimal choice and doing it right. Do it and wrong or right, you'll learn something. I mean, try to do it right. Don't just do it randomly. Try to do it right, but you'll learn something from it. And if you just go through life like that, pretty soon most of the things you do, you'll do right because you'll learn pretty quickly. Okay, anybody else have a microphone? Where are our microphone girls? Ah, there, we got one. Where do we? Uh... Okay, so I have a question, Tom, about um, 
So I've been trying to follow the philosophy to make it about other, because then I know I'm coming from a place of love. And when I make it about me, I'm coming from a place of fear. So I see that um, I do this, especially in my intimate relationship. I make it about him. I make it about him. But um, I'm not happy. So uh, I guess I want to know, like, where's the boundaries that I need to put up? You do your best you can, and you've got a, you've got a strategy there, and you're trying to work that strategy. If it just doesn't work, you're not happy. Pick a new strategy. Do it differently. Say, okay, that's not working. What could I possibly be doing wrong? And think about that for a minute. What is it that I need to do differently? And maybe you'll get an idea. Oh, well, maybe I should you know, think about it this way. Then try that out and do it that way. So don't be afraid to just experiment. Again, don't be afraid to be wrong. Just do the best you can, see where those chips fall, then make adjustments. So you, we can trick ourselves, it's so easy. Those egos are so slick, and you know that, that that's why you asked the question. Those egos are so slick that you never know whether you've just been you know, hoodwinked by your ego or whether you're really truly giving and caring about the other person. That's a hard call sometimes, you don't know. Why are you, you know, why, you know, what's your, what's your motivation? But I'd say that if you end up not happy, what you're doing isn't working. And then it's probably not right. Okay. Now that's probably it. It's not necessarily the case because the people you're interacting with have free will too. And you may be doing it just exactly right, but you've got somebody that isn't responding to that. You see? So it's not always that you're not doing it right. It may just be that you're doing something that just isn't working. You know, it's just like you can't go up to people and say, do you want to talk about the nature of reality? You know, that's not going to work. You know, so you don't do it because you know it's not going to go over very well. So it's not you. It's not that there's anything wrong with the nature of reality. That's actually a very good subject. And they probably do need to talk about it, but they don't know that they need to talk about it. So in that case, it's not your fault for you know, wanting to talk about something very valuable, it's kind of their issue because they're not interested. So you may be doing it right. If you think and you feel you're really doing it right, well, try it again. Try it with somebody else. See if it works better the next time. And if it keeps not working all the time, then think maybe you're not doing a very good job of choosing people for it to work with. And if that doesn't fix the situation, then certainly you ought to change your approach. But I know you, and I know you're serious about growing up, and I know you're serious about getting rid of that ego and fear. And I know it's a very difficult thing to do. So I suspect that what you're doing is trying very hard to do it right. And you're probably getting it most of the time. Some ego is bound to slip in there some of the time. Fear is bound to be at the root of all of it because you have some fears that you have to deal with. But I suspect that your partner needs to also be grown up enough to make that a two-way relationship. You see, it only takes one to love. Love is a singular thing. It takes two to have a relationship. You can love people that you don't like. So, you, know, you need to have somebody that will work with you. And that may just be a matter of time. Sometimes that's a hard thing to find. So hang in there and uh, you, can, you can either see what you think you need to change and if you can't come up with anything and you think you're doing it right, then go ahead. See if somebody else might not be a, a, better, a better person to, to do that with. But also think about your picking process. Sometimes people are really, really good at always picking the wrong person for their significant other. They're really good at it. I mean, they, you know, give, them a, give them a choice of 100 different people and they can pick out the one of all those 100 people that they will be the most miserable with. 
and that's the one they want. You know, it's just that way. So you also look at your picking process. You know, if you're, are you just picking those kinds of people that are unlikely candidates? You see, so that can be another choice problem. I say, what are the criteria? And do those criteria have anything to do with the capacity of love? Okay, and if it's like, well, not really, then you need to change your criteria in your relationships. And sometimes that means you need to change friends, change the circles that you hang out with, change you know, the places you go. Sometimes all of that is part of the problem. So you can, you know, you're young. You're just a baby. <laughs> You're young. You got, you got a lot of time to try all sorts of different things and see what works. There's the, yeah, there's no, there's no rush. This is not a time test. I know it seems like you want to get it right and get it right now, but it's not a time test. Take your time and be aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it all the time and try to be a better judge of quality of people and look at what are the criteria you have that makes you interested in somebody and does it have anything to do with their quality or does it have to do with other things? Does it have to do with your needs or your fears or some other kind of thing like that? So you'll get there. You'll get there. I uh, right. am confused about something that I came in here pretty convinced I, I knew and now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. We've Taking some steps backwards there yeah. into more confusion. Okay, I have that effect sometimes on people. Well, that's good. Um, you had mentioned that uh, when this lady had asked about coming into the body, uh, deciding whether you were going to be in the body or not, mm -hmm. and you had, the way you stated it or the way she stated it was that, like, the consciousness comes into the body. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. but I know... No. That's what I was thinking, that it's not no, like that. No, consciousness doesn't come into the body. That's a metaphor. Okay. Right? Going out of body is a metaphor. Right. The body's just ones and zeros in a computer. You don't go, I'm going into the hard drive, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, and you, and you don't have to get out of your hard drive either. It's not like that. The body doesn't have a soul living in it someplace, you know, somewhere between the lungs and the backbone, you know. That's where your soul hangs out. It's not that way. Consciousness is a, is a, your individuated unit of consciousness, your free will awareness unit, is in a different reality frame altogether. This is a digital reality. So it's like you're the consciousness, your elf in the world of Warcraft is the avatar. You don't live inside the elf. It's the same thing. You're the player. The elf lives there and, and you're not inside the elf, although you are the elf's consciousness. You are the elf's soul. Without you, the elf is just ones and zeros. Doesn't do anything. Doesn't think anything, takes no actions. It's not until you say, stand up and dance. You know, does the elf stand up and dance? So the elf is just ones and zeros until you play that elf. You're the consciousness, you're the soul of that elf. So you don't live inside the elf. Now if the elf became conscious, he might think you do because you live in a virtual reality outside of his world. You're non-physical, and if he doesn't know what else to say, he knows it's kind of him, something inside of him that animates him, he'd say, I've got this soul inside of me that, you know, does all these things, because where else is it? If it's not inside of you, it's not there, it's not there, you know, it's not in this reality at all, as far as he's concerned, it's someplace else. And what we do is we take someplace else and make it inside of us, because we don't know where else to put it. Well, what happens then when uh, a person channels and they get this other consciousness? Right. Okay. And then you see these people that are channeling and they act like there's this, you know, something that's coming over them, which I can understand that that's really just their reality that they're doing. But what's the, what's the different consciousness coming into the person that's not? Oh, the, the consciousness comes into the other body? Yeah. All of that is a tool. Okay. Okay? We make up tools that help us 
understand what we're doing and help us do things. So, you know, tool is, is, is a device that we make up. It sometimes, it sometimes can be a ritual that we go through. But we have these beliefs, and our tools have to fit our beliefs. So if we have a, if we have a concept that there's an entity out there, and that entity wants to say something to somebody, well, they have to say it in this physical reality so that you know, the air moves and the other person's ears, drums move, and they hear it, right? Otherwise, that person isn't going to hear it. So then we have to channel it. So we get the information and then we pass it on. Well, that's just a tool set. It's a thing we do. So that's a way of transferring information. So what happens is the medium connects to the database, gets the information, connects to an entity, but just often it's not, it's a database, connects to something, gets a data dump. They take that data dump, put it in to their own words, their own language, and speak it. Now, that gets problematical for some people because they got to get it, translate it, and speak it. They have a big tendency to embellish, to explain, to add things that make sense to them. So it's easier for them, this is a tool, if they don't actually take it on, think about it, and send it, it's easier for them to just stream of consciousness because now they don't have to give themselves time to embellish. So one of the tools is, I'll just let them talk through me. They're still doing the same thing. They're getting the message, they're translating it, and they're telling them, except now they're doing it in real time rather than in chunks. That's the difference, and it's just a tool. And you can learn to do that, it's not that hard. You know, these people, are translators at the UN, they sit there and the guy's talking, and they're listening and they're talking at the same time. And when I give talks sometimes in foreign countries, I have people doing that. I stand up here and talk about the same rate I am now, and they sit in a little booth with a microphone. They have a headset on where they hear me. They have a microphone where they're talking to people in some other language. They have to translate what I'm saying into another language as I say it. And they have to be doing that translation getting it all together, because you know, it's not just a transliteration. They really have to translate it and figure what this concept is, how to express that in another language, and get it out of their mouth while they're listening to me with the next concept. So it's a skill that you can learn. The mediums have learned the skill, and they're just doing it in, all in one, and it actually is better for them because they have less opportunity to add and subtract from the message on their own. It's, a, it's a really a better way to do it in that sense that you don't have that opportunity to ponder over and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Let me, let me turn that around a little bit. It'll make a whole lot more sense. I must have gotten that wrong. This other way, it's more of a, you don't have time for that processing. So that's how that's, that's working. It's a, it's a tool. It's a way of, it's a, you know, it's just a technique. Tom, yes, you've mentioned uh, that uh, this reality frame that we live in, um, it's pur purposely had rest restrictions placed on it uh, for our growth, you know, to help mm -hmm. our growth. Well, as we, um, you know, evolve our, in the reality frame, <clears throat> excuse me, it seems like we're overcoming those restrictions by understanding it better and taking advantage of, you know, mm -hmm. overcoming the rule sets and um, would that mean, I mean, I, w I want you to, to, to expand on this, but I, I would assume that we would bump up again more and more, uh, different types of restrictions as we learn, right? Is that how, or what would, uh, how does this reality frame become, not become ineffective because we keep overcoming? Is there a point where we overcome to the point where then those restrictions are no longer effective to keep us, you know, yeah. growing? So, some of it that's true and some of it not. Uh, take the uh, sign certainty principle for an example. That's not so much a rule set as it is just company policy. And it's company policy because of the level at which we are. If a lot of people who have very high entropy knew that you could put ideas in someone else's head with your intent, that knew that you could 
heal or hurt with your intent, right? that knew that you could listen to other people's thoughts with your intent. You could even taste the sandwich they were chewing with your intent. They would use that for their own egotistical needs. They would abuse it. We have that all over coastal Africa. If you've ever been there or lived there or know people that live there, all you have to do is ask them about it and they will tell you it's a pretty rough place sometimes because there are people there who for hire will you know, make the person you don't like ill. Or they will extract money from you by threatening you. I will, you know, I will make your children sick if you don't give me this much money. Okay, it's a racket, it's a con game, but it's using intent to make money. Well, okay, you can use intent to get a raise. You can use intent to, you know, manipulate your children. You can use intent for all kinds of things put ideas in people's heads. I mean, all that's possible, you see. And if that were widely believed, then this could be a rowdier, more unpleasant, nasty place to live, just like those places around coastal Africa. Everybody knows that works there. It's part of their culture. It's common knowledge. So it can be a pretty mean place. You don't want people to know about that unless they're grown up some. Well, for the most part, if you're not grown up, you're not very strong with it. The more grown up you are, the more powerful you know, your intent is. So the people doing this aren't particularly strong at it, but they get by that by doing it in groups. They get by that by practicing a whole lot. They get by that with the other people being frightened being fearful, and they can connect to those people through that fear. You see? So part of their thing, the reason it works, first thing they do is write a letter or make a speech about what they're going to do to you, you see? And then they tell you about all the things they've done to other people. What they're trying to do is get some fear. If they get some fear, then they have got a connection to you that they can use. What you've done is just built a super highway between them and you with that fear. So part of their entree, that's why you pass a doll with a pin in it or something because that's the fear creator, you see. Otherwise, there's no need to do that. You could just do your thing, you know. Why, why make a little doll and pass it around first because that's your first, that's your first thing is to establish that connection with fear. So if too many people were aware of that, too many people would abuse it. Now, how can I just talk about it and everybody can see it and be aware of it? Well, that's because it's a nice correcting system. All the people who would like to do that and abuse it are the same people who won't believe a word of it. They're not very grown up. You see, their low quality consciousness, they don't get it. It's nonsense. That's that superstitious stuff that takes place over there in coastal Africa. A bunch of superstitions. That doesn't, nothing happens like that. So the very people who would abuse it are the people who won't pay any attention to me, which is good. That's kind of how that works. But if it becomes widely known, you see, if somebody demonstrates it on, uh, you know, 60 Minutes TV and whatever, then suddenly it's real. It's believable. Some old guy with a, you know, with a white beard gets up and talks about it, you know. Yeah. You know, that's just some, some lunatic, you know, some crazy guy. So the science certainty principle says that when 60 Minutes comes around with cameras and takes all the pictures, it doesn't work, it fails. And that's just something to protect us here from too much knowledge, you know, maybe from too little knowledge in the wrong hands it can be dangerous. So that's, that's why. And yes, that rule will change. As we grow up, that rule will change. Science certain principles can start to go away once we grow up past the point of, a, of very many people abusing it. And it can be a widespread thing. And everybody can be more aware, work on a, on a mental level. But we're not ready for that yet here. And we don't want to descend into the, into the high entropy that's 
happens in other places where that is common knowledge. It's better for us to just think that that's superstition. And people who talk about that are fools. That's safer. So the yeah, things will change. So the, rule, the rule sets can change as we grow up. I'm mean, not the rule sets, but the, the, you know, the, the things like psi uncertainty will change as we grow up. Now, other kinds of rules, the rule set itself isn't going to change. The rule set is just that perfect set of rules that evolves a stable universe that allows us to, you know, allows us avatars to exist. So you're not going to monkey with that. That's going to be pretty stable. Now, will you allow people to get around that rule set, do things that the rule set doesn't support? Yeah. The reason they don't do that now, at least in public, is the science certainty principle. Right? So if you know how to levitate, well, you can just levitate all you want in your bedroom. You levitate in front of the cameras, you won't be able to get off the ground because that's just not allowed. It would damage our chances of growing up. So that's those kinds of things is, is, uh, is the, way it, the way it works. Okay, we have more? Yes. Uh, thank you for your generosity uh, with the information. And Can you hear me? Just barely. Speak up. Thank you for your generosity with the answers. Ah, and you're welcome. My question is, do we need um, to find happiness or a peace to become love? And becoming love um, means also becoming ethical in some point? Yes. Well, when you become love, you already find happiness and peace. That goes with it. It's a package deal. So becoming love, you become ethical. You know, you become moral. You find happiness. You find peace. All those things just happen to you all together as you become love. So yes, they all, they all run together. It all works as a package. You don't get just one of those. You, you get them all. But the key is getting rid of the fear. So as you get rid of fear, all the rest of that stuff happens. Ethics, you talk about ethics and, and morality, what is right and what is wrong? Right? People discuss that a lot. Well, as it turns out, what is right is what lowers entropy. Not just for a minute, or not just in a local instance, but in general, in the bigger picture, in the long run. What's an entropy lower is right. What's wrong is an entropy increaser. So right and wrong are defined by whether it helps or hurts your evolution. That's what morality is based on. So we find out that love and peace and caring and empathy and you know, compassion and all those things they're all right. Running over somebody else's free will, that's wrong. All that is high entropy. It makes things worse. It doesn't pull us together. It doesn't create uh, where we're going. So, you know, morality just comes with it. Anyone else have a mic? Yes. Oh, there you go. Uh, Tom, my question is on severe mental health issues and suicide. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on people who cannot make decisions um, here in this reality because of severe mental illness? And even when they do have the chance, they may commit suicide. Mm -hmm. What do I think about such people? Um, well, there may be you know, there may be lots of reasons for that. It could just be they were unlucky when uh, dice was being rolled and all those, uh, um, you know, genetic things were being decided and they ended up with just bad brain chemistry. You know, it could be just that simple. They got the, they, when it reached in and took a draw out of the probability distribution about how all those chromosomes would, would match up, they just ended up with a body that didn't make enough serotonin or made too much serotonin or something else and now they have bad brain chemistry and that torments them or makes them so they can't have empathy or makes them so that they whatever you know so it could be just that simple in which case it's something for them to it's a handicap for them to live with and if they can learn from and you can learn from things like that it's hard but you can learn from things like that 
like, uh, you know, what was it, uh, A Beautiful Mind, you know. He learned from it. He was aware of it. He accepted it. And he basically, he couldn't control it, but he learned how to live with it. So he, could, he would ask somebody he trusts, you know, is this guy really here, right? When the guy, the guy in the movie came to tell him, would he accept the Nobel Prize or something? And he asked the student, do you see this man? <laughs> you know? And he says, yeah, I see him. He says, well, okay, he must be there. You see, so that was ways of dealing with it. And he could not, he did that without embarrassment. You see, a lot of people wouldn't be able to do that. They couldn't have, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to have enough quality of their own that they would ask somebody else to verify their reality. So see, he learned from it. He grew with it. And uh, that's possible. But that's a tough one. You know, you might be, you might be uh, uh, severely retarded. That's a tough one. What are you going to learn from that one? Well, this uh, taking an avatar is risky business sometimes. That being born, you know, severely mentally retarded is maybe what? I don't know what the statistics are, but one in 50,000, one in 20,000, that you're just really severely retarded. Well, if you happen to draw that card when your genetics, when your genes are all uh, in flux, trying to make whatever it is you're going to become when you're born, that may just be the call. And that lifetime, it's just going to be that way. But you still might learn something. You still might learn to be peaceful rather than angry. You know, simple things like that might be fine. And you might offer a lot of lessons to all the people around you that have to deal with you. You're going to teach compassion to all sorts of people. You're going to teach tolerance to all sorts of people. So, see, it works out. And okay, out of your 10,000 lifetimes, some of them turn out out of the tails of the curve, and you get as much as you can out of them, and that's all right, because you get another one and another one and another one. So it's, you know, it's not like that's a great shame. It's just that happens sometimes, so we deal with it and go on. So, yeah, that stuff happens. Now, for the people that can't deal with it or don't deal with it well, well that's a problem. But that they don't deal with it well is not going to, like, de-evolve them because it's not really their choice to be mean, say. It's just the way they are because of the way their brain chemistry is. Now, sometimes it has nothing to do with brain chemistry. Sometimes, particularly schizophrenia, sometimes you hear voices. You see things. You know things you shouldn't have. You just got more than your data stream in there. You're, you're picking up on other things. And because in our culture, if you... Say, oh, I just I hear voices and they're telling me this and they're telling me that, and I you know I get this information, and sometimes I guess often it turns out to be true or not. But what do you think? You think I must be going insane, and you drive down to the hospital and you say, Doc, you know I hear voices, I did this, I get these visions, and they say you need some medication. Well, they really don't need medication. They need somebody that can help them understand what it is they're seeing and put it into perspective and have it not teach them how they can shut it up when they don't want it, how they can let it in if they do, how they can control it and so on. But what we do is put them on pills. And after four or five or six years of your life being on those kind of medications, you're damaged goods at that point physically. So... You know, that's unfortunate, but again, one out of thousands, it's just the luck of the draw. So we do, we, we are, we hurt people who are in that category. That's a category of people that our, that our medicine that helps a lot doesn't help much because we have very little understanding and compassion for people like that. We put them on meds because otherwise they're inconvenient. These people are very inconvenient for us. And... We make them more convenient by chilling them out, pacifying them with medication. And now we can just warehouse them. Forget about them pretty much. Visit them on Christmas, you know, it's, it's sad, but that's the way it is. So a lot of those cases are, are brain chemistry, and others are just misunderstood. 
if anything, you might say it's a gift. You know, they have a gift that a lot of other people have been working very hard. You know, I want to hear a voice. I've been trying to hear a voice for years. You know, I, I, I keep asking, hello, is anybody out there? Please talk to me. And they don't hear any voices. You know, but uh, in the wrong context, you know, that could end you up on, uh, on a whole string of drugs that could uh, basically incapacitate you for a long time. So there is mental illness that's, that's biological, and there's mental illness that's just defined that way because it's unusual and we don't understand it. But then, when we confuse it and don't understand it, we create genuine mental illness with the drugs and with the treatment and with the expectations and the way you're treated and so on. You know, if there wasn't mental illness to begin with, well, we make sure that there is by the time we're done because we don't treat people that are different from us very well. Hi, Tom. I have a question about uh, the source the uh, Monroe man mentioned in his book. So um, some other guru also mentioned uh, this state, this source. They say like they've been there and they're facing the choice. Uh, they can stay in this reality or just leave. So can you explain more? It's kind of confusing. Why they say they can stay in this reality or leave? Source. The source. Bob Monroe talked about it. He went to a place called the source. Yeah. Oh, okay. And the source could. Like uh, he feel like in the simulation, and he facing a choice. He can stay in this reality or just leave. So Bob said that that he could stay and leave, not that the source could stay or leave. Then he went to a place where he had this choice. Yeah. Oh. I mean, what is this place? Oh, I see. That he had the choice. Um, Probably, uh, well, Bob Monroe was a very good um, explorer. He was very good, and I trust his reports a lot. I knew the man and worked with him. He tells you exactly what his experiences were, and he didn't confuse them, didn't embellish them. He just said the way it was. So that was his experience. But he didn't really understand what was behind the experience. He didn't necessarily understand the big picture. Like when Bob Monroe got trapped behind a wall and he couldn't get back, couldn't go over it, couldn't go around it, couldn't go under it, I don't know. That wall was his fear. See, That was his fear. And it manifested as the wall. So there's, he thought that the places he went in the outer body were places like Chicago <laughs> that you could go. And he had this park that he went to that was his, his place of relaxation. And you know, not everybody wanted to go to Bob's park. Well, that park was just in his mind. That was his metaphor for a place of relaxation. Other people have different metaphors. See? So his park was somebody else's mountaintop, somebody else's rowboat in the lake, somebody else's home on the front porch. You know, it was just his park. It was not that there's a park in the non-physical. It was Bob's park, out of his mind, his metaphor, but he didn't understand that what he saw wasn't just as real as Chicago. That's the way he saw it. What he saw was a metaphor for the data he got. The data he got was, this is a calm, wonderful place to hang out because his intent was, I want to go in a calm, wonderful place I want to hang out. And in his mind, that translates to a park with nice big trees and lawn that's kept well and never grows, grass never grows too long, you know, it's always just nicely manicured and so on. So he had this park because that's how he interpreted that, the data that came to him describing that place. Okay. So when Bob and Roe got to the source, well, sure enough, he was probably had a, a sense of, he was interpreting a connection with the larger consciousness system. Now, the larger consciousness system can appear to you any way that makes sense to you. The larger consciousness system can be your grandmother, or it can be Jesus, or whoever you want it to be. And it will use the, the guise, or it will use the disguise, if you want, of anybody that you'll take seriously. If it's giving you serious information. Because if it doesn't take that guise, you won't take it seriously. 
Okay? If you ask a question and say, you know, what's the meaning of life? And what you get is a, you know, is a, is a talking duck. You know, you have this big duck and you go, rah, rah, you know, the meaning of life is, you'll blow that off. You won't pay any attention to that. You know? But if it's an old man with a robe and a long beard, you know, he looks like Obi-Wan, you know, <laughs> and he comes and he's very solemn and his voice is, you know, like this, then you're going to believe it more. So the larger consciousness system will approach you and if it has a serious message for you in a way that you'll take seriously. So for Bob, this was the source. And because he didn't have any real picture for that source, well, it was just a, you know, it's a kind of a nondescript source, right? He just said it and he didn't describe it a whole lot because he didn't embellish. So he was, he was good not to embellish. That's why the source was just kind of the source. And he got this idea that he could come or go however he wished. And that was personal for Bob. It wasn't necessarily that that was for everybody. That may have been that at that point he had accomplished the things that he was here to accomplish. He was one of those guys that comes here with a mission. He did his mission. He's accomplished his mission. And that may have been saying, you can leave anytime you want. Okay, you're done. Good job. Did your mission. When, you, when you've had enough, you know, welcome home. So that could have been, but that's for Bob. That's not necessarily that that was for anybody, you know, who wants that. In general, if you're out of body, that's not your choice. Your choice is not you can come and go anytime you want. You're here doing this thing. You've got an avatar and copying out is not a good thing, right? Which takes us back to suicide, which I didn't mention. Copying out is not a good thing. You can always do that. You can say, oh, this is just one out of thousands of lifetimes, and this one really sucks. It's bad. I don't see any way out. It's awful. Nothing but blackness ahead. No light at the end of the tunnel. Why don't I just end it all and start fresh? That sounds like a good idea. Okay, well, if you have that, that's suicide. You don't have any any hope for the future. Suicide happens, people get depressed. Depression is when your world shrinks. Instead of having all these decisions, choices in your decision space, you don't see any. Your only choice is between bad and worse. That's it. There's nothing else in your world. So you, your reality shrinks down to just something that's awful and you can't see anything else. That's depression. Okay. Depressed people tend to commit suicide because they don't see any hope, any point that anything will ever get any better and it's miserable and painful. They want out. Okay. So what happens? Well, if they kill themselves and they get out, then they have to get another life. There's no penalty. It's not like, oh, you committed suicide, you know, three black stars. You know, now you have to do penance or something. There's no penalty for that. As far as that goes, there's no punishment ever. The punishment is just that you, you, know, you have to deal with the consequences. And the negative consequences of that, that if you opt out with a suicide, that's part of your experience base. That makes it easier for you to opt out with suicide next time or another time. And if you opt out enough times, pretty soon you have this, this inside you, it's just part of your consciousness that when the going gets tough, you exit. You run for the door. Well, now you have really limited yourself in what you're going to learn and how you're going to learn it. You see? So you've really made your, yourself a much tougher row to hoe. You've really hurt yourself that way. You it's a suicide out of love, though. So, for instance, you know, I have to talk this over. I'm getting up in age. And were I to determine that I have Alzheimer's, I don't want to burden my wife. You know, so yeah. Yeah. I'll answer. Yeah, I can answer that too. Oh, he didn't have a mic. Okay, well, when I get to that, I'll answer that. So the, the downside about suicide is that it makes it easier next time because what you've done is you've copped out. Life is too hard. I can't stand it. Let me out. Well, you know, that's easier next time, easier the next time, and it can go to a bad place. So that's the downside of suicide. Now, that's if you cop out. The other hand, 
if the suicide is because you know you have a fatal disease, it's costing you know hundreds of thousand dollars a year to maintain you. You're 98 years old, you know, and uh, you know you can't hear, you can't see, whatever. But they can keep you alive at hundred thousand dollars a year, which looks like a good deal to them because you never complain because you can't hear, you can't see. So, you know, if you're in that stage, and you say. You know, this is not helpful. It's not useful. It's not useful to me. I can't learn anything. I'm always on drugs for the pain. You know, what's the point? That's different. That's not copying out on a bad situation. That's actually a better choice. So then you make that choice and you move on. Different than this is tough. Too tough for me. I need to get out. That's really like you say, it's about other. It's not so much about yourself, it's about others. You see that, that you're getting very little out of it and other people are having to pay a whole lot for it. So you, you see the trade isn't good, so you make a rational decision. That's a, that's a different kind of thing than exiting out of desperation, inability to cope. You know, it's a totally different thing. So suicide is, is uh, you know, there's no basic penalty for it other than you can start a bad habit. And the other penalty is you lose the opportunity that you had for the rest of that life. Okay, now you've had a lot of investment in it. You've put years and years and years of investment in it and you may be able to get out of that. You may be able to do really well. You may be able to learn a lot of lessons from that. There's any number of people who have been terribly depressed and at that bottom of their depression is where they found hope. You know, that's the, one of the darkest night of the soul or some kind of thing like that, where you hit bottom, and when you hit bottom is where you begin to realize that you've created a lot of the problem yourself and you need to grow up because there's no more excuses. You can always make excuses, and you can blame everybody else until a certain point, and then you realize there's nobody to blame but yourself. And often that's the point where you start growing up. So depression can be a growth experience. You see, and if you're depressed and you don't stick it out, you may miss that growth experience that could be really helpful for, for you. So the exit, the early exit, is a throwing away all of that potential opportunity. That's the other downside that you've invested in. So it's, it's, never, it, it's, it's uh, generally not a good choice unless special circumstances like that, and then it probably is a good choice. So, now, where were we? We had your, we had your, did I ever finish your question? Yes, you covered it. Do I, did I get to it? Yes. Okay, I know I kind of wandered on you there and got into something else, but okay, you're welcome. Yeah, it's the prime mover. Okay. Intent. I don't think my definition is too far off from the normal English definition. Intent is your your motivation. It's why you do what you do. It's your intent. What's your intention? Uh, let's see if I can give some examples. Um, well, if you are healing somebody, it's your intent to heal them. It's what you want to accomplish. That's your intent. And you're placing your intent to change the probability to heal them. So in that case, it's, your, it's what it is you want to accomplish, what you want to do. And if you are, um, let's say you're in a discussion, and what you do is you raise your voice in a discussion. Well, your intent is to drown other people out, be heard over them because they don't know what they're talking about and you do. You say your intent is to impose. That's your intent. So we have intentions that are high entropy and intentions that are low entropy. So intent is why you, why did you raise your voice? Well, fear. You weren't being heard and you're right and people just weren't paying attention to you. You see, that's, that's an intent. So it's kind of the, the end point of what it is that you are really trying to accomplish. Not what you think 
and you tell yourself you're trying to accomplish, but what you at the bean level are really trying to accomplish. Uh, of course, you tell yourself you raised your voice because these other people were just lost. They were off target. They were no longer being productive and you were going to bring them back. See, well, that may be a good intent if indeed that's the case. Or it may be that they just weren't listening to you. So it's not the action, you see. It's the reason behind the action. It's the value behind the action. The quality behind the action. All of that defines the intent. So when you're healing, your intent is just that, it's to heal. And that intention needs to be focused. And what I mean by focus is that Typically, if you put an EEG on your head and look at your brain waves, right now in this discussion, you'd probably have a lot of beta. That's kind of the awake frequency. You'd have a lot of beta. You might have a couple of spikes or two above the beta. You'd have some alpha because we're kind of all tired now. We're getting a little, you know, relaxed and so on. And then you'd have some of all the rest of the stuff. But you're scattered all over the frequency, but your dominant would be beta because that's what we're doing. Okay, so that's, let's see, where was I going with that? Intent. Focus, yes, focus. Talk about getting tired, yeah. That's focus. <laughs> I evidently don't have it, but I'll try to explain it to you anyway. So when you focus, your, your, your mind has to, one, get rid of all that noise in it. All those frequencies are doing like this. If you look at a spec your spectrograph of it, a frequency versus time, you know, it's doing like this. Predominantly, it's in this area, but it's all over the place, flying around. Well, in our mind, we experience that as thoughts and feelings. And thoughts and feelings are flying all around all the time. Some of them we're aware of, some we're not, but they're always going on. When you have focus, all of that quiets down. There's nothing there except what you're focused on. That's called that's clarity. No other thoughts. That's harder to do than it sounds. That's what meditation does. The whole point of meditation is to learn to quiet all that noise and just let your mind be blank. Well, once your mind's blank, you can put in it exactly what you want and nothing else and keep all the rest of that stuff out. But until you can make your mind blank, you can't make it very well focused. So that's the focus is to reduce the noise that's going on because then all of your mental energy, all of your intent, can be focused on healing that thing, that person. That's more powerful than if it's just if your mind's, okay, you're trying to heal them, but you're also thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow and what the sum of the head and the things you have to do at work. And your mind's going over with all this stuff, and it's a very weak intent. So that's, intention is like a, a lens that focuses. So I can have a lot of light coming through a window, but it can't really do a lot. But if I put a big lens up there and focus it, I can burn a hole in a piece of metal. You see, same light going through the window that you can stand there in front of, and it maybe warms you a little bit, but that light can burn holes in things. So it's that. You can burn holes in things with that tint when it's really focused. And you can just add a little heat if it's not. So intent is, is uh, something we have to learn to focus. Clarity is something we have to learn to get. And we have to be able to hold that focus. And typically the way we do that is with meditation. That's the whole point of it. Meditation has no point other than to help you get rid of the noise in your mind. That's it. And when you get rid of all the noise and all the sense data, now you're in point consciousness. Now you're at the door to everything else. So that's why everybody says, well, how do, where do I start? Meditation. That's why. Get the noise out of your mind. So it's not too far off from the intent that's in the English dictionary. I think it's pretty much the same. And intent is kind of like figuring out what it is we want to do. And this is sort of like that. You want to heal. <laughs> you want to take charge of the conversation. You want to look better than your coworkers so you get the raise. So that's why you, you know, tear his report up while he's gone home or something. You know, whatever, it's, in the, it's the intent. Even though in your mind you say, well, this looked like scrap paper and I was trying to clean up the office. You, know, you justify it some other way. But there's what we think and then there's our real intent behind it.